so my name is Suzanne Mitchell and I'm from the Healthy Food Centers at, from Allegheny Health Network. My location is Forbes. We currently have five locations. We're getting ready to open a location at Allegheny Valley Hospital. We help patients that suffer food insecurity. Um, our pantries are set up with healthy foods. We have low sodium canned vegetables. We have fruits that are in a natural syrup or a light juice. We have a variety of fresh produce and meats, a very nice program. Uh, today here at the library, we're gonna talk about trendy diets, uh, the pros and the cons of trendy diets. Um, so there's several types of diets. Conventional diets are defined as those with the energy requirements above 800 calories per day. Uh, these diets would fall into the following groups. We can do a balanced low calorie diet and a low calorie version of healthy diets, such as the Mediterranean diet, um, DASH diet, keto diet, lots of different uh, trendy diets out there. We do low fat diets, low carb and low glycemic index diets, high protein diets, and then very low calorie diets. So. Fad diets, which are usually diets that involve unusual combinations of foods or different types of eating sequences, they're extremely popular, um, but only for a short period of time. Most fad diets would not be sustainable for long term. Um, whenever we're trying to lose weight, the weight loss of 5 to 7% of body weight will carry numerous health benefits. It should be sought out as an in initial uh, weight loss goal. Weight loss of more than 5% can reduce risk factors for cardiovascular disease, um, for your lipids, for hypertension, for diabetes, and just to help with overall weight loss. Um, so also keep in mind, whenever you decide that you want to, to go on a diet, you want to be patient with the diet. You want to lose maybe one to two pounds per week. And keep in mind that we don't gain 30 or 40 pounds overnight, so we're not going to lose 30 or 40 pounds overnight. Um, you don't want to be discouraged whenever you're trying to lose weight or follow a weight loss program. So. If you took 500 calories per day off of what you normally ate, you would lose about a half of a kilogram per week. Um, and just to let you know, 3,500 calories would be one pound. So that would be a way to slowly maintain it. So after three to six months of weight loss, um, the loss of the lean mass slows your body's response down. Um, with that initial change in the energy intake or the deficit in those calories, you would lose weight. Um, but in order to continue to lose weight, you would have to change that formula again. So if I were going to try and lose weight and I would get rid of maybe, let's say I would go from eating 1,800 calories to 1,200 calories a day, I would lose weight. Once I got to a certain weight, I, I would plateau, which I'm sure everybody who's tried to lose weight you hit that spot where you can't move it. So you would either lower the calories or be a little more physical. And that's how you would move that weight again. But you also want to be careful with weight loss. You don't want to cut your calories down below that 1,200 or you know, below a certain point because you still need to maintain um, calories just to keep your body going. So the best method to calculate your estimated calorie needs, everybody here would have so many calories you would need per day just to move your arms, uh, blink, breathe. It would be your metabolic rate. Um, the way that we figure that out is we use a formula and we use the mifflin saint Jor equation. You can find that online. Um, that's probably the, one of the better ones to use. And with that um, formula, it would calculate multiple factors using your height, your weight, your age, your gender, your activity level. Um, so you would figure out whatever your needs were that way. Um, there's many formulas you can use online. That would be the recommended one. Um, and you could look that up if you're interested. It would be hard for us to go through that today with everybody here in the room. 
So some general advice, reducing your total energy or your total calorie intake should be the main component of any weight loss intervention. To implement a successful dietary intervention, you can perform a 24-hour dietary recall where you would record what you ate in the last 24 hours um, to just to give you a general idea of what types of foods you eat. So tips for weight loss, you would want to eliminate any um, high calorie beverages, juices, sodas, um, frappuccinos and different types of flavored coffees will have a lot of calories considering a plain cup of black coffee has no calories once you add creams and sweeteners and everything else and some of those can be five to six hundred calories. Uh, processed foods also would be something you would want to eliminate for weight loss. Portion control is very big. Really want to watch the portions of what goes on the plate. Um, just self-monitoring. And you want to adopt something that's healthy and long term. So instead of thinking of it as a diet, you might, might want to think of it as a change in the way that you're eating. So when you self-monitor what you're eating, you can involve uh, the use of food diaries, activity records, weigh yourself, uh, whatever works for you. There's no right or wrong. Some people don't like to weigh themselves till the end of the week, that's fine. Some like to weigh themselves every day, that's fine. Whatever works for you. You can use apps to track your calories. And there's a million of them out there. Whatever one is the easiest for you or the one that you like is the perfect one. There isn't one that's better than the next. Uh, whatever works for you. So any uh, balanced low calorie diet, you would want to plan a diet that requires the selection of calorie intake and the selection of foods that would meet the intake or meet what your needs are. And you wanna make sure that you're picking foods that have adequate nutrition. Um, the healthier foods, fresh produce, fresh uh, meats, low fat dairy, things that you're gonna get that maximum amount of nutrition from and not waste your calories on uh, processed foods and unwanted calories like drinks and whatever. Weight reducing diet should minimize or eliminate alcohol, sugar containing beverages, highly concentrated sweets. They usually don't have much nutrition to them. That would also help for success too, to eliminate those things. So I compiled a bunch of different diets that are pretty trendy. And we'll go over the, just the main components of those diet, diets and the pros and cons for the, each of those diets. And I did a handful of them. The first one is the Mediterranean diet. Um, this one, this one probably has the most benefits too, um, just based on the research that I did. So some scientific evidence of the Mediterranean diet's beneficial impact on human health was first, uh, first posed for cardiovascular disease. In post-war Europe, an American scientist, his name was Ansel Keys, he studied how famine induced a decrease in um, coronary attacks or heart attacks. And he pr proposed an association between the reduction in high fat and high calorie diets and how heart health outcomes would be. So at the same time, Ansel Keys observed a higher incident of heart attacks among middle-aged businessmen in the United States. The findings suggested the possible influence of dietary habits on heart health and heart risk, heart health risk, and became the basis for Keyes and, co and his colleagues. Um, they did a study called the Seven Country Study. This study reported cardiovascular disease incidence and mortality data in seven, several different uh, Mediterranean regions. Despite the evidence, the Mediterranean's the Mediterranean diet's positive effect on human health was not globally recognized until the 90s, until the 1990s. So over the years, a large body of evidence has sustained the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet for heart health or cardiovascular disease, also with type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and cancer as well. 
So the scientific evidence for each outcome, it's variable and it's based on different studies. And of course, more studies are required to really understand the role of the Mediterranean diet better. So some clinical nutrition research examines the effect of dietary interventions on biological or health-related outcomes in a determined study population. So the evidence that was produced in different studies and the one that I looked at helped with dietary guidance and public health messaging. Um, the update of the clinical trials registered on the database for clinicaltrials.gov it evaluated the effects of the Mediterranean diet on health and specific diseases. And the findings revealed that an increased number of clinical trials in the last decade and found that the most disease related studies focused on cardiovascular, metabolic, and then cancer. Those were the three for the, that study. The majority of the Mediterranean diet's beneficial effect could be primarily related to its anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, as well as the effectiveness of the dietary patterns where it helped to control uh, weight loss, helped with um, help people to lose weight by eating healthier on this diet. So strict and long-lasting last, adherence to the Mediterranean diet um, as well as the beneficial effects of the specific components where you're eating um, olive oils, um, healthier fats. It seemed to emerge as useful insights for intervention, intervention improvements. Um, so some of the findings were the relationship between diet and immune response. It's very close concept, although their um, interaction is extremely complex. The nutrition status as well as the specific new micronutrients can influence the function of the immune system and also the level of microbiota. So that would be your gut health is always very important too. Um, it helps your immune system, which will definitely keep you healthier. Um, Undernutrition can lead to lower effectiveness of the immune system. So when we're not eating foods that are so good for us and we're trying to live on processed foods and things that are not nutrient dense, it can affect your health immensely. The Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet is connected with um, cancer, autoimmune disorders. Um, it reduced incidence of inflammation. And it's believed because of the components such as the monto, mono unsaturated healthy fats that would be in that diet. It's also high in vitamins, minerals, micronutrients. <laughs> uh, the Mediterranean diet provides further implication in protecting and mitigating against major determinants of the immune competence, including stress and pollution, which I thought that was very interesting to see that it actually does affect some of the stress on your body from pollution. So the Mediterranean diet refers to a dietary pattern that's common in all of growing areas of the Mediterranean. It would involve plenty of fruits, plenty of vegetables, breads, other whole grains, potatoes, beans, nuts, seeds. Olive oil is the primary fat on the diet. Um, Low-fat dairy products, eggs, fish, poultry, and that was in low to moderate amounts. Fish and poultry are more common than red meats in the diet. It also centers on minimally processed plant-based or plant-based foods. Also, wine may can be consumed in low to moderate amounts, usually with meals. And then fruit would be the common dessert instead of sweets. It emphasizes vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, legumes, and it includes low fat or fat-free dairy products, fish, poultry, non-tropical vegetable oils and nuts, and really limits added sugars, any sugary, veg or any sugary beverages, sodium, anything that's highly processed, any refined carbohydrates, saturated fats, and then anything that's fatty or processed as far as meats. The American Heart Association has a claim on its website that this style of eating can play a big role in preventing heart disease and stroke and reducing risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, 
Um, there's some evidence too that the Mediterranean diet rich in virgin olive oil may help remove excess cholesterol from your heart, from your arteries and to keep your blood vessels open. So all in all that, that diet got a really good rating as far as health and sustainability. It's definitely something you could stay on for the rest of your life. Um, the next diet that I thought we could talk about today too is intermittent fasting. So we're seeing a lot of that where people are using this to lose weight. It's an age old practice of fasting. It's historically rooted in religious traditions. Um, the within day eating restrictions of Ramadan, prolonged fasting in ancient, ancient Greece and Old Testament times typically for spiritual purposes. In addition to cultural and religious significance, the practice of fasting recently um, appears to have some clinical benefits, particularly as an intervention against obesity and some of the problems that come along with obesity like diabetes, heart disease, um, trouble walking, just different, um, different pathologies that would come along with that. Although a number of different dietary restriction strategies have been employed in practice, they're generally classified under the umbrella as intermittent fasting. So there were several ways that you can use intermittent fasting. Some people may eat for 24 hours and then fast for 24 hours. Um, some may fast for two days and then eat for five days. Um, this way, when they use it that way, they would get about 25% of the maintenance of the needs of the calories that they need to keep their body going. Um, there's also two other kinds of fat intermittent fasting. One would be to eat only in the morning, like eight hours out of the day and then stop eating. And then some people will eat a little later in the day and use that, eat whatever they want for those eight hours. And that's it for the day. So it's been well established that a wide range of meal frequencies and distributions can be effectively utilized to improve your body composition or weight loss. So again, think about it. Any time that we change the amount that we eat or the way that we eat, we're gonna, we're gonna have some movement there, whether we lose weight or it just stays the same. Usually though, whenever you have a deficit in calories, you're gonna lose weight. So currently a substantial body of evidence supports intermittent fasting as a variable diet approach that performs sim similarly to conventional uh, linear dieting for reducing fat mass. The strategy would seem particularly appearing, uh, appealing to those who prefer to eat as much as they want or as often as they like. So those that like to eat, this may work for them. It remains unclear if underlying mechanism factors associated with intermittent fasting may be more or less favor favorable for body composition changes in certain individuals as opposed to others based on genetic or disease state. Um, individuals with type 2 diabetes should be cautious, cautious about the diet because of hypoglycemic um, potential for intermittent fasting, so where they can have a, a low in their blood sugars, um, that can cause some issues for them. Intermittent fasting has been associated with eating disorder characteristics. So if intermittent fasting may be risky for individuals that are struggling with psychological impacts of food restriction in general, a study reported significantly longer menstrual cycles in, the, um, in a lower age group so going from 29 days versus the 27th, and that would be in young, overweight women. Uh, final note is that internal cues to consume fluids are di diminished also um, with the absence of meals, elevating the importance of staying hydrated on the fasting days. So with the benefits, the warnings reinforce the importance of staying vigilant about individual variation in response to the dietary, um, the diet of intermittent fasting or really any type of diet that you go on, you wanna you know, be cautious of the side effects for those. The next diet that I brought some information on today is the keto diet, which is also a pretty popular diet that we see. So keto diet, Russell Wilder first used the ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy in 1921. 
He also coined the term ketogenic diet. Um, for about a decade, the ketogenic diet enjoyed a place in the medical world as a therapeutic diet for pediatric epilepsy. It was widely used until its popularity ceased with the introduction of anti-epileptic agents. So just recently, the ketogenic diet was, a, was used for rapid weight loss. Um, so it's a new concept for that, and it is quite effective, at least in the short run. Ketogenic diet primarily cons consists of high fats, moderate proteins, very low carbohydrate, the dietary micronutrients are divided into about 55 to 60% of fat, 30 to 35% of protein, 5 to 10% of the diet would be your carbohydrates. So in a 2,000 calorie per day diet, the carbohydrate amounts to about 20 to 50 grams per day. So that's pretty low. The adverse effects, the short-term effects, so up to two years, of the ketogenic diet are well reported and established. However, the long-term health implications are not well known due to limited literature and limited research for this one. The most common and relatively minor short-term side effect of the ketogenic diet includes a collection of symptoms like nausea, vomiting, headaches, some fatigue, dizziness, insomnia, um, difficulty in exercise tolerance, constipation, this is called the, the keto flu. These sim symptoms revolve in a, or resolve in a few days or a couple weeks. Um, making sure that you get adequate fluid and electrolyte intake can also help counter some of those symptoms. Long-term adverse effects include um, extra fat in the liver, hypoproteinemia, so that's too much protein in your blood, kidney stones, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. People that are, have diabetes and taking insulin or any type of hypoglycemic agents can have severe hypoglycemia if the medications aren't appropriately adjusted before they start the keto diet. The ketogenic diet should not be practiced in patients that have pancreatitis. Uh, liver failure or any type of fat metabolism disorders, uh, probably because the diet is very high in fat and it can really affect that. People on a ketogenic diet rarely can have, or can actually have a false positive alcohol, breath alcohol test, yeah, because of the ketones, false positive alcohol breath test due to the ketones, due to keto ketonia and acetone in the body can make it appear that you have alcohol on your breath. Long-term compliance is low and it can be a big issue with a ketogenic diet, um, but that can be with any type of lifestyle change or any type of trendy diet, can, that can happen. Even though the keto diet is significantly superior in the induction of weight loss, um, healthy patients with obesity and the induced weight loss is rapid, intense, and it's, it's induced or sustained until at least two years. The understanding of the clinical impact, safety, tolerability, um, the duration of treatment and prognosis after de decontinuation of the diet is challenging, and it would require further studies to understand any disease-specific mechanisms that go along with the keto diet. Um, this diet can be followed for two to three weeks or up to six to 12 months. You wanna closely monitor your renal function while on a keto diet. That would be imperative. And the transition from a keto diet to a standard diet should be wet, um, gradual and also well controlled. So this diet is probably not a good long-term diet. So to counter the obesity epidemic, some healthcare workers will recommend the keto diet. However, the primary healthcare provider, nurse practitioner, dietitian, internalist, um, anyone who's recommending it needs to be aware of a few facts. Overweight individuals with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and type two diabetes will see improvements in the clinical markers of the disease risk with a well-formulated, very low-carb diet. Um, glucose control improves 
due to less glucose um, introduction and, and improved insulin sensitivity. So in addition to reducing weight, especially like a truncal obesity and insulin re resistance, low carb diets can improve blood pressure, blood glucose regulation, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol levels, but LDL cholesterol can increase on the diet. So in various studies, the ketogenic diet showed promising results in a variety of neurological disorders like epilepsy, dementia, ALS, traumatic brain injury, acne cancers, metabolic disorders as well. So due to the complexity of the mechanism and the lack of long-term studies, a general recommendation for keto for prevention of type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease would be premature but it does, it is effective for weight loss. So if you're using that to lose weight and not try and treat other, other um, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, um, it will be okay for the weight loss part. So while in the short term, the ketogenic diet may help you lose weight, it's not sustained over the long run. Um, in addition, countless studies show that the diet's associated with many complications that lead to emergency room visits and admissions for dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, and hypoglycemia, where your blood would go really low, your blood sugars. So ketogenic, it's a term for a low-carb diet, similar to the Atkins diet. The idea is for you to get more calories from protein and fat and less from carbohydrate. You cut back on most of the carbs that are easy to digest, like sugar, soda, pastries, white bread, when you eat less than 50 grams of carbohydrate a day, your body eventually runs out of fuel um, that it can use quickly. This typically takes three to four days. Then you'll start to see a breakdown of protein and fat for energy, which can make you lose weight. This is called ketosis, where that burns. It's important to note that the keto diet is short-term diet that focuses on weight loss rather than any health benefits. So on this diet, you would have meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, cheese, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, uh, half and half, cream, unsweetened plant-based milks, veggies like green, uh, green leafy vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, peppers, summer squash, um, for high fat, olives, avocados, and you would avoid potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions, beets, corn, winter squashes, such as acorn squash and butternut squash. Well, I hope whatever diet that you decide to follow is one that will be sustainable and healthy and one that will not cause you any health issues and to help you meet your goal. And also keep in mind when you do weight loss, even physical activity is a very important factor along with paying attention to what you're putting in your body. You wanna make sure that you're picking foods that have the most nutrients to them versus foods that don't have the nutrients. Um, and also, if you're able to do physical activity, that's always very important to keep everything moving and to help burn calories. Well, thank you for coming today. Thank you. You're welcome.